afternoon. And thank you for the invitation to speak here today. I'd like to thank Professor Swigart, Imagine fellow panelists and the audience. I've been enlisted to talk about human rights law and it, as it relates to Brazil's dilemma and as has been posed today, the so-called balancing act. And I'd like to start to do that by talking, framing human rights law as it relates here uh, through two stories, a uh, tale of two anniversaries, if you will. The first one being in the year 2000. So we are in Brazil in a state called Porto Seguro, which is where the ships of the Portuguese landed in the year 1500. Uh, so 500 years later, the Brazilian state decided to uh, commemorate this date. Uh, President Fernando Henrique Cardoso was on hand. He was supposed to sign a friendship agreement with the president of Portugal, uh, the former colonizer, and there was going to be parades and other celebrations and of course, um, as to frame this discussion, uh, fittingly, nobody consulted the peoples in Brazil who still feel colonized today. Um, so there were protests by indigenous leaders on hand to say, what exactly are we celebrating here? 500 years of what? Um, so there was a letter given to the Brazilian president complaining, and I'll quote, uh, we are not celebrating anything. And in the street protests of the indigenous leaders, uh, the military police of the local state was called out. They were given orders to keep the protesters out of this celebration. Well, the orders were not actually successful. Protesters made it anyway. 3,000 people marched towards the president and stopped, uh, according to BBC correspondent Ian Bruce, 100 meters before the police line. At that point, uh, the Brazilian state accuses the protesters of becoming violent, but as the BBC correspondent describes it, quote, the police then advance on the protesters firing tear gas, stun grenades, and dispersing the protest in a handful of minutes. Um, so that's one anniversary celebration, and what does it tell us? In the words of uh, Yanan Mami, Brazilian indigenous leader, Severino Brasil, um, he says, we have already lived 500 years of lives. We resist and want to rescue all that was taken from us. How are we to understand a party to commemorate the injustices we have lived through? So what can we take from this story? I think a, a story of official insensitivity, even as late as the year 2000, and as I will see, unfortunately still continues today. Um, ongoing degradation of uh, indigenous people's lands and environment, um, invasion of lands, and, uh, and even degradation of places that have been demarcated. So that is one anniversary. Uh, the other one is 500 years of the arrival of Columbus. So eight years prior, 1992, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights decides to write a report, one of the first that it is doing on the subject of indigenous rights. Now, indigenous rights was um, an oversight of the states when they were negotiating various human rights treaties, you might say, because they're not explicitly mentioned. But the commission and the court uh, in the inter-American system, as well as in the European court and the African system and so on, have read in obligations based on protections of minorities generally, as well as perhaps ironically, based on the protection to the right to property in the American Convention on Human Rights. And in this anniversary, in 1992, the Inter-American Commission opens by saying that the fact that 1992 marks 500 years since the arrival of the Iberian conquerors on this continent, this offers us a singular perspective for analyzing the historical elements that have shaped the problems suffered by indigenous populations. Now this, uh, I submit, is a much more human rights friendly paradigm walking into this kind of anniversary and reflection, and it largely informs how modern human rights doctrine around indigenous rights has developed. So some of the key features uh, here that I'll highlight today, and time-wise I'll only highlight a few, 
are, uh, as I said, the protection on land as one of the key protections for indigenous peoples. Why? Because land is <coughs> instrumental to the cultural survival of indigenous peoples in the way that they live. Um, and it has historically been the way that they have been threatened uh, and their survival threatened, um, not only through violence, which has been very pronounced and serious as well over uh, hundreds of years, but also through subtle means, or more subtle means, of assimilation and so on. And where you finally end up with the realization that there are many ways that uh, peoples can be uh, threatened. And in, in terms of the major touchstones of human rights law then, protecting cultural survival and so on, uh, interestingly the famous landmark case that starts off the jurisprudence is a Brazilian case, the Yanomami Indian land case in 1985. So this is still a time, or as has been mentioned earlier, under Brazilian law indigenous peoples are considered legally incompetent. Um, as a way of supposedly protecting them. This is no longer the case. Um, but the Inter-American Commission finds a violation there based on uh, the amount of miners, farmers, and other degradation linked to the construction of the Trans-Amazonian Highway through some of their territory as well as other territory, bringing all sorts of devastation and population figures as the Yanomami Indians also go down by the tens of thousands fairly rapidly. Since that time, the jurisprudence has developed with uh, more detail, and I'll just mention today uh, what would be required and is by law, human rights law, in order for any development to take place in indigenous lands. Uh, there are three safeguards have to be followed. The first is free prior informed consultation. Uh, now, what does that mean? Free means non-coerced. Uh, consultation that doesn't happen for, for instance, in the, in the presence of heavily armed military police. Um, informed uh, means people are actually given information that they would need to make a real decision, and in a language that they speak, which is not necessarily Portuguese, and in a manner that they can be receptive to. So respecting leadership structures and other features within indigenous tribes. Um, and it is prior, meaning consultation comes first, and not second, not let's uh, make things work now that we've already invested a lot of money, but consultation is the first step before any other development step is taken. That's safeguard number one. Safeguard number two is called benefit sharing. Um, the idea that if development is going to take place, after consultation, after incorporating thought suggestions, participation, and so on from indigenous groups, that they should actually share in some of the benefit of that development and not just be these uh, uh, unfortunate victims of it or neglected in it. And finally, the third safeguard is a prior independent assessment of scientific based on uh, social impact and environmental impact. <coughs> Um, those are things that are required before taking this step and one umbrella principle articulated by the Inter-American Court would be that any major project that risks essentially fundamentally altering or decimating a culture or a way of life, a livelihood, or lives themselves um, requires actual consent. Consultation is not even sufficient. Um, so that's the law as it stands today. Now let's talk about a recent case in the little time I have left, and that's Brazil. Very big case, you will come to hear about it if you haven't yet already. It's called the Belo Monte Dam case. Belo Monte is uh, slated to be, if completed, uh, the third largest dam in uh, the world. Um, the project is going, is said to be flooding 500 square kilometers of land, 193 square miles, displacing 20,000 people, changing the river, lowering the output of the river, submerging rainforest, causing vegetation rot that uh, uh, emits greenhouse gases, and as you might imagine, people indigenous to that area are opposed to the dam project. This is an ongoing case, 
one where Justiciable Bao, an NGO that I work very closely with, um, has sought protective measures from the Inter-American Human Rights Commission uh, on behalf of the uh, tribes there. The protection was granted in 2011, and the commission said, stop building the dam until you can show you have met these safeguards. Uh, Brazil's response, it was unfortunately alarming and evocative of the story I began with, of 2000, where uh, President Dilma, new president, uh, said that the Inter-American Commission did not have the legitimacy to make this kind of finding that this was outrageous, that Brazil has a right to develop, um, although I guess excluding some other Brazilians in that formulation, and withdrew the ambassador to the OAS, threatened to cut funding to the OAS, some uh, uh, many millions of dollars, and uh, said that it would not abide by the uh, formulation. What happens then is it kickstarts a reform process of the inter-American system that has, it's now almost two years in the making, it has diluted those protections and threatened the uh, legitimacy of that system to some degree, although it's fighting back now. But you have other countries jumped on board to take advantage of this political moment. And for instance, Venezuela denounced the American Convention uh, in the midst of this reform process, saying that the Inter-American Court was biased against um, it, and so on and so forth. So this has been a very negative um, uh, outcome for the, both the protection of human rights in the region and for Brazil. Um, I think this is an area where Brazil stands to be, could be, a leader um, in terms of what it offers to the world. It is trying to rebrand and become the country of the future and, and the rise of Brazil. Everyone talks about BRICS. Um, Respect for human rights and sustainable development and protecting the environment are actually all the same, but they have to respect each other. If, if one of those pillars isn't there, then we're actually talking about something else, I think. And so when we're, uh, we have um, an event titled The Balance and Act, I'm very happy to participate, and I'll just submit in terms of balancing uh, that Human rights law already does some of the balancing for us and says that cultural survival, protection of indigenous lands, the right to participate, be consulted, and so on, those are all baselines from which you start to balance after, not before. Um, so on that, I would just like to finish with a uh, note from the Shingu uh, tribal peoples who are litigating in this case. Um, in talking about Belamonchi, where they say, the river is the heart of our land and our people. We will not sit back and watch while those in Brasilia attempt to determine our future without our consultation, without hearing us, without respecting us, and for some, without ever having set foot on our lands. Neither the Shingu River nor our lives are for sale. Um, and as a human rights lawyer from Brasilia, which they could say, I take that to heart and I hope we all come out of this doing the same. Thank you.